Hey everybody, it's your boy, and recently I was thinking about the subject of love and hate in regards to identity politics. You always hear from the identitarian left how we need to love more and hate less. That just using words that imply a hatred of their favourite identities would literally kill trans people or minorities, or that checking one's privilege, becoming a good ally, would be the opposite. That would be using love, one would imagine. But of course, as we know, this love and this hate is not reserved for all of mankind, nor is it even reserved for some individual within these special interest groups. Moreover, it seems to me that the worst thing you could feel towards a special interest group is not excessive love, which the left term fetishization, or even hate, but indifference. But let us talk about hate first. Hate, as everybody is taught at an early age, is a strong word. Oftentimes, people prefer to use the term dislike when talking about negative things they don't like. But what do the left say when they mean by the term hate? Hate encompasses all the isms that you would imagine that they label people when they criticise or express dislike of certain special interest groups. And it's often used in a very blanket and general way, whether it be constructive criticism, pointing out certain issues within said communities and groups, all the way to the most base and abhorrent views, like saying one group is inherently superior or inferior, or advocating for genocide. They use this blanket approach because it helps to shut down debate. If one side seems to be arguing convincingly against the left's vision for their special interest groups, accusations of hatred and the use of an ism has been used successfully for decades to silence and tar the opposition. It also allows them to group moderate, perfectly reasonable opposition with the extremists that the left is actually competing against. By grouping someone who is pointing out an issue in a community and wants to address it with someone advocating actual hatred against this community allows the left to destroy the opposition by painting them all as extremists, hiding their own extremism by playing the Martin Bailey and appearing far more moderate than they actually are, and tiring the opposition with the same brush. Hatred is also a feeling, much like love, that can be stoked, and can be stoked far more easily than love can be in many ways. It appears that throughout history, and especially in recent times, it has been much easier to stoke hatred and division than it has been to promote love, mutual respect, and unity. Ideologies like feminism and critical race theory have been used to push division and hatred between whites and minorities in the West, and between men and women. The goal is the classic tactic of divide and conquer. It's much easier to gain power and influence against divided enemies than it is against a united front. The left know that their social ideas are not actually as popular as they would like to make out, especially in a society that is as close to moving past race as an issue that we were a few decades ago, for example. By teaching these ideologies in school to the young by using the media to create false narratives and consent, hatred can be stoked within all these different groups. Not only that, this stoking of hatred also keeps thousands of leftist activists, charities, lobby groups, think tank and NGOs in a job. Think about it. What use are anti-racism organisations if black people now have the same legal rights as white people and have about as close to the same opportunities in life also? What purpose do they have? None. And with jobs on the line, a grievance needs to be found. Likewise, aside from making sure men's rights is always suppressed, how do feminist organisations find a purpose for women now that their legal rights have been solved? How do they still make out they are freedom fighters and not the oppressors they always have been? Find a grievance. Stoking hatred between men and women and the different races solves that issue. Critical race theory is not just about trying to divide minority groups from the mainstream white cultures of the West, but also to make the whites either become submissive or outright hate minorities. Affirmative action is not something that is meant to to help minorities necessarily. It is designed to make sure that the white redneck in the trailer park is resentful that he is still stuck unemployed and degraded, whilst the hoodlum in the ghetto is getting a job and funding for education, purely based on his skin colour. Hatred provides a purpose for the left to continue being relevant. They want people to hate. It's their currency. It pays their wages. Likewise, love can be used in this way, but it's not love that you and I may be used to thinking of. It's not the love of brother and sister, of friends, of lovers, of parents towards children. It's a different kind of love. It's a submissive kind of love, and a form of negative, unconditional love. The identitarian left want you to have unconditional love for groups. They also want this love for themselves, being the faction currently in control of the elites. They want you to love these groups because, in their opinion, if you do not, 
it is tantamount to the basest hatred, which therefore leads to murder and genocide and the loss of rights. At least, that's how they say it would lead to. So you must love these people if you feel any kind of empathy for your fellow man. If you don't love trans people, then you must want them to be killed or to kill themselves. If you don't love minorities, you must want to oppress them. It's the false dichotomy. But not only do they believe in this, they believe you must love because they want your submission. The best way to describe it is how a tyrannical king extracts love from his subjects. They must love him, otherwise they will be punished. Likewise, you must love your leftist overlords and their special interest groups, or you'll be cancelled. By virtue signalling that you have nothing but love for all people that they want you to love, you will not be oppressed. Expressions of love are used to make people obedient. Even though they preach love thy neighbour and that we must love minorities, not all minorities are treated to this love. Because remember, they don't necessarily have to be prejudiced against these people on biological grounds, but on ideological and political grounds. This is why people like Kanye West, Clarence Thomas and Thomas Sowell are not considered black by leftists because they do not act in the way that has been decided is black or as a minority by Marxist critical race theorists. They are now politically not black. This is how they weed out dissenters within these communities and keep the populations docile. It's also why they can feel free to spout the vilest racial hatred towards these people. Anita Sarkeesian has just recently espoused ethnic cleansing of Israelis. She can say this because the state of Israel is not politically Jewish, nor are the Arab Israelis politically Palestinian or Arab. If you think the latter are safe, you're dead wrong. They have, in essence, been unpersoned, and it also ties back to hatred. But even then, they would rather people love and hate than feel something even worse. Indifference. I have probably experienced more backlash for being indifferent towards a group and treating them on an individual basis than I would have done if I had loved or hated them as a group. The identitarian left hate indifference. They hate it because it's not apathy. Apathy is fine because it's part of the black pill and signals that you have been defeated. Indifference is different because it is neither love nor hate, and more often than not, leads to the type of love they do not want individuals within their chosen boogeyman group, white people, and their chosen victim class, minorities, to feel towards each other. Brotherhood. If you are indifferent to a person's race or sex, you are hardly likely to start judging them based on these things, nor see things through a racial or gender lens. You're more likely to interact and befriend said people. Cross-cultural exchange will occur. Cultural integration, dare I say, may be the end result. The dreaded cultural appropriation. Identitarians of all stripes hate this. The reason why the identitarian left had to attack colour blindness was because it was leading to whites, blacks, Asians and people of all races to come to some kind of acceptance, if not harmony, with each other. Which, as mentioned before, not only offended them ideologically, but hurt them financially. It's why they pushed divisive policies, narratives, used historical grievances to stoke up division, and made damn sure that this woke mess came into fruition. Likewise, in the Deep South, why do you think the white establishment that enacted Jim Crow as part of its propaganda promoted eugenics? and the superiority of whites. Why did they use the state to tell people who they could and could not live with? Because indifference breaks their ideology and the culture they want to create. This is why we need to promote indifference and to push it. It's the only attitude that can destroy identity politics. Now this is not the same as promoting indifference to suffering or to cultural and political issues. Far from it. In fact, removing the identity politics from the equation, using indifference, would go a long way to fixing issues unique not just to white culture, but also to black culture. A large part of the reason why in places like Chicago or London have massive numbers of black young men being murdered is because the left makes damn sure that these men stay in those positions and anybody who tries to fix the issue is labelled as a racist, therefore nothing can be done. Identity politics suppresses these issues and makes sure that when someone tries to highlight them, either nothing is done because of their massive influence or the person is suppressed. Indifference would allow those with the ideas and the means to fix these communities to do so. It's not a coincidence that memes that have blacks and whites engaging in mutual but respectful racial banter towards each other tend to have the punchline, this is what they fear. It's not a coincidence that people like Daryl Davis have had enormous success in de-radicalising KKK members by simply befriending them and not judging them based on their race. Because an indifference towards race, or any arbitrary characteristic for that matter, and an appeal to the character is the strongest antidote and the biggest factor towards positive and friendly relations between people. This was probably, whether he knew it or not, what influenced Dr Martin Luther King when he made his I Have a Dream speech and wanted a world where we are judged not by race, 
but by character. So anyway, I think I'll end it there, guys. I believe that the only attitude that can destroy identity politics is indifference. It's the ultimate weakness that all identitarian movements share, and will foster better unity. Essentially, I am arguing for freedom of association and for character to take precedence, when judging people, and a case for individualism. It's probably a bit of a pretentious title for such a topic, but I felt that it was something that was worth discussing. Tell me what you think in the comments, and until next time, I'll see you all later.